On Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Foundation for the Carolinas, inspiring philanthropy and empowering individuals to create a better community. And by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. Through yoga, I also discovered meditation and the idea of sitting with your breath and observing your mind sounded actually familiar to me. I was used to observing my mind, but the difference now is that I was not trying to understand what was happening. I was just trying to live in that moment, in the present. And through that, I was also able to understand that that is really where God is. It's in the present. It's not in anything I'm doing. It's just in what I'm living in the moment. It was really good for me. I felt that release of responsibility about having to act, having to do. And I started to learn to just enjoy the present moment and enjoy being. Beatrice Friedman is a school counselor, yoga instructor, IT consultant, researcher, and world traveler. Her school counseling incorporates mindfulness to help students develop self-awareness and self-control. She recently completed a 27-year career at IBM, where she held numerous positions, including as a business value consultant, project executive, application development manager, and systems analyst. She worked for IBM in Brazil, Canada, and the United States. In this episode, we explore growing up in Brazil, a practice called Legosophy, emigrating to new countries, a summer of loss and pain, finding new purpose, and becoming present one step at a time. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Welcome, Beatrice. Thank you, Mark. Beatrice, you have lived this remarkable life of a project management professional who worked for an international company for 27 years, who emigrated to two different countries, who raised a family in three different cultures, and who is starting an entirely new career in midlife with plans to migrate to a fourth country while overcoming personal challenges and discovering a more authentic version of yourself along the way. I'd like to begin at the beginning. Where were you born? I was born in Brazil, in beautiful and sunny Rio de Janeiro. It was the early 70s. They were called the golden age. So there was a lot of growth and opportunity. But at the same time, we had a military dictatorship. And the government slogan was, Brazil, love it or leave it. <laughs> So there was this duality about the enthusiasm for the growth, but at the same time, you had to comply with the rules, otherwise choose to leave. And how would you describe your family? We were, I would say, a typical middle-class family. We lived in a house with three bedrooms. My mom had a maid to help her with the housework. And my father had this Volkswagen Beetle, which was very uh, popular in Brazil at the time. My father was a chemical engineer. He worked for an international company. He traveled a lot for work, which meant that I would get cool gifts from places like United States. <laughs> and my mother, she was an English teacher. She also spoke some French and German. In fact, both of my parents have German background. And my mom and dad had three kids. First came my brother, Eduardo. He has special needs. And then I came, and then I have a younger brother, Marcelo. And Eduardo was born looking really normal. But when he was a few months old, he was not developing as expected. And my parents found out that he has this rare condition, which is called Lennox-Gastaut. 
That meant that my brother was never going to be able to read or write. He would only speak a few words and basically would never be independent. So my mother was very dedicated to my brother. I imagine it was very hard for her because there were not a lot of resources, not a lot of information about special needs uh, kids at that time. But my extended family lived close by. Both sides were there, and they helped a lot. They provide a lot of support, and I always saw them, so I know we were very close. Beatrice, you mentioned the special needs of your brother, Eduardo. How did his illness impact you? I was very aware that he was different, and I saw my mom worried about him. My dad's worried about him. I also saw my family really always talking about ways to support him. So I became very independent and I didn't want to give any more work to my family. So I understood the situation that we were in. An event happened when you were young that changed your life. Yeah. So when I was nine years old, my mother passed away with cancer. It was a very traumatic event uh, for my family. She was a young mom with three kids. And I still remember the day that our dad told us about what happened. We were at home, and my dad was really sad. And I asked him, so, Dad, uh, when can we visit Mom again? So he called me and my younger brother, Marcelo, into his bedroom. He sat us down, and he told us, your mom is not at the hospital anymore. And I asked, where is she? And he couldn't get himself to tell us, so I was the one who actually said it. I said, did mom die? And then he just shook his head, and my brother really didn't understand. He was six years old, so I took on the responsibility to try to explain to him what death meant. And there was not really a lot of talk about what happened, but there was a lot of action. My family really jumped to help. We moved in with one of my aunts, who became our second mother, and another aunt took over the responsibility to care for my older brother with special needs. She basically became his mom, still is to this day. And uh, my family really was um, looking into giving all my brothers and I a stable home life. And that's what happened. And for my part, I tried to be strong. I tried to behave well. I did not ask a lot of questions about what happened. My father married again, and I gained a beautiful baby sister, Clarice. And it was good. I basically pushed away what happened, and I was a happy child. Beatrice, this event did happen, and your family did move on. But how did you internalize your mother's death? I became very independent. Uh, As I said before, I did not want to create trouble for my family. I wanted to do well. I wanted to have good grades. I remember in school at the time, they posted grades at the board, and I really liked seeing my name at the top. And looking back, it was probably a way to drive attention to myself. But at the same time, I know that I became afraid of facing and expressing my emotions. For example, I did not have a picture of my mom in my bedroom. I never had And growing up. And we really did not talk about her very much. So there was this suppression of emotion that was happening. Beatrice, there is a philosophy that you grew up with that informs your values and spirituality. What is that philosophy that your family taught you? It's called logosophy. It means the study of knowledge It is a philosophy, it's not a religion. It's almost more like a way of living. It originated in Argentina. It was very popular in Latin America in the mid-1900s, especially Brazil. That's where it grew the most. And it's still growing today. There are people who study Logosophy in the U.S., in Canada, and also in Europe. And what is it that Logosophy teaches? The goal of Logosophy is for self-understanding and conscious evolution. And it's like a metacognition approach where we learn to think about our thinking. It's very analytical in a sense, but it's also very action-oriented. 
it has a method. It's based on a prescribed method. And the method is uh, you study about your mind, your inner emotions, and then you analyze your actions to determine how they align with what you're studying. And it teaches that the best prayer to God is how you conduct your life. So the actions you take, the words you speak, that's how you communicate with God. Beatrice, here you are suppressing the emotions of the death of your mother and studying Legosophy. How would your friends have described you as a teenager? They would probably describe me as very studious. I took school very seriously. I was not a troublemaker at all. They would say I had a plan. People had confidence that I would do well. In fact, I heard that from many of my teachers. Oh, you will pass into the universities. You will do well. But at the same time, I was uh, somewhat closed up. For example, I remember when I was in high school, I had a very good friend and we had diaries. And one day my friend said, oh, let's, let's exchange diaries. You read mine and I read yours. And I said, okay, that's great. As I was reading hers, I was very surprised at how open and vulnerable she was in her diary. She was talking about her emotions, her struggles. My diary was, today I went to school and I had English class and, you know, I saw my cousins and that was it. So her diary was uh, something I was not familiar with. It was different for me. But I was nice and friendly, <laughs> but very cautious with my emotions. You were also very ambitious. I really wanted my independency. Uh, I chose computer science as a career because I liked math, I was good at math, and I knew that I could make good money with uh, that profession. I went to the Rio de Janeiro Catholic University. It's a private institution in Rio. I took a program that basically guaranteed a job after you finished that program. And IBM was one of the hiring companies from that program. And my goal was to work for IBM. It was a beautiful company with lots of offices and international opportunities. When I graduated, I got a job with IBM. And I was really happy. I worked very hard. When I was 26 years old, I got my first management position with the company. I had a team of programmers and business analysts and project managers. I was responsible for a development project. I was very proud of myself. I had this beautiful office of overlooking the beach. I had a secretary. I felt really good about what I had accomplished. And Beatrice, while you were at IBM Brazil, you met someone who became very important to you. Yes, I met my wonderful husband, Carlos. He was a young and handsome engineer who lived close to me. We took the same bus to and from work, and very quickly we fell in love. Carlos was very open with his emotions. I remember when I turned 21, he made a huge banner saying, Happy birthday, Beatrice, I love you. And he placed it in front of my house. <laughs> and I had never seen anybody do anything like that. So it was really new to me. He also asked me about my mom. He encouraged me to talk about my feelings. So after we were dating for about a year and a half, we got married. And next year, we will celebrate our 30th anniversary. <laughs> Beatrice, here you are, you and Carlos, living a life in Brazil as young professionals at IBM. How would you describe your life then? We had a great life. Uh, we lived in a beautiful house with a swimming pool in a gated community with family and friends close to us. We both had great jobs. We also had a lot of services. I had a live-in maid. I had a 24-hour nanny for my daughter. We had a gardener, somebody to wash the car. And my favorite was a person who ironed my clothes <laughs> every week. So, And we were not rich. It's just that we were a young couple, two people working with good jobs, and that's the lifestyle that it afforded. And yet you and Carlos made a decision to leave Brazil and that lifestyle behind. Why? 
Well, although we had this great life, it bothered me. It bothered me that we had to live behind gates, that we saw so much inequality. And the violence was also escalating at the time in Brazil. We couldn't go out at night to some places, and it was scary. Especially after our first daughter, Sonia, was born, we felt that we had to keep her in a bubble. We were also worried about the future of Brazil, the economic future, and wanted to have better opportunities. And also, the other thing was uh, we worked very far from home, so I would leave home early, come back late in the evening, and I was missing out on some of Sonia's milestones. I remember missing her first time that she, she sat by herself. I was missing some new foods that she was trying, and that made me really sad. That was not sitting well with me. Beatrice, you did name your daughter Sonia. Where does the name Sonia come from? Sonia was the name of my mother. And it was really hard for me to name my daughter Sonia. I remember in the first weeks, I couldn't really call her by her name. So it was a, a strong feelings to have another Sonia in my life. When I was missing some of her milestones, I felt like I was missing some of her life, like I had missed some of my mom's life. That was a really strong and not good feeling. Beatrice, there came a time when you and Carlos decided to leave Brazil and the life that you had established. Where is it that you decided to go and what was the immigration process like for you? Yeah, so we decided that we wanted to leave Brazil and we really wanted to come to the United States. We visited here before, we loved the lifestyle, we thought we could be closer to our kids, give them better opportunities. But then uh, we realized that to immigrate to the U.S., you needed a company to sponsor you, and we couldn't get IBM to sponsor us. So we decided to take the matter in our own hands, and I did my research and found out that Canada had an immigration program with a path to citizenship, and they were accepting skilled professionals. So we decided to apply to Canada we went through the process, the tests, the exams, submitted all the documentation for Carlos, Sonia, and I. And when we received the visa back, I was pregnant with our second daughter. <laughs> so we said, oh, what now? And uh, we decided that it was probably not a good time to immigrate. So I remember receiving the big paper with the visa and putting it to, into our bedside table drawer and feeling a little you know, disappointed about that, but it was okay. And it kept moving with our life. And then one day I decided to call the Canadian embassy to let them know that, you know, we have the visa, but we're not going to immigrate now because I'm pregnant. And they informed me that if my daughter was born in Brazil, she was not part of the visa. The visa was for three people. We would have to open our process. We would have additional costs. It would take additional time. So that's just the way it was. I remember Carlos and I driving to work one day and discussing that situation. At the time, I was pregnant, seven months pregnant. We looked at each other and we kind of knew what we were thinking. We were thinking we should do this now. We need to get our daughter born in Canada. So we had a plan. Uh, Carlos was going to quit, and I was going to go in maternity leave because I was already around the time that I could ask for my maternity leave. And this way, if the plans did not work well, Carlos and I could come back, and I would still have my job, so we would, we would be safe. <laughs> and that's what we did. We told our doctor, my doctor had to write an authorization for me to fly because I was past uh, 30 weeks. But our family was very supportive and they encouraged us to do this. Beatrice, you moved to Canada. What was that like for you? It was really great. 45 days after our landing, our beautiful daughter Juliana was born. Carlos uh, got a job with IBM in Canada. I got a job with IBM in Canada. We had a wonderful life. Our daughters did have to go to daycare full time, 
but I was the one dropping them off. I was the one picking them up, and we would come home. Carlos would cook. I would bathe, and we were really hands-on parents, and that's what we were looking for. That's what we were missing in Brazil. It was uh, really wonderful, but there was this uh, balance of trying to give them a bit of our culture while at the same time learning this culture of this country that we did not know much about. I remember sitting with the girls, they were really young, and we would draw pictures of little girls with two flags on their hands, the Canadian flag and the Brazilian flag, uh, to show them that they had those two things. And we would play Brazilian music in the house and samba. So that's the way we were trying to really communicate to them our culture. As they started to grow up, it became a little harder. They started to prefer to speak English, for example. It was hard to get them to speak Portuguese. And they started to teach us about the culture that they were learning at school. I learned a lot from my kids. And in fact, I still do <laughs> to this day. Beatrice, people who have not taken their family to a new country and immigrated may not fully appreciate the challenge of that experience. What was that like for you? Yes, it is uh, challenging being an immigrant parent. You know that uh, you want to pass on to your kids your culture. You know that it's important for them to have the language. But at the same time, you know that it's not their fault that you brought them to this country. And this is their country. It may not be yours, but it is theirs. So you have to be very conscious of that and very flexible with allowing for some of for them to experience their own culture, while at the same time having a way to show them that a little bit about your culture of origin. Beatrice, there is an emotional experience of leaving your country of origin behind. How did you feel about leaving Brazil? Yes, it is an emotional experience, and uh, there is a little bit of a guilt there. And the guilt comes into different places. So, for example, sometimes I think if I should have stayed in Brazil and helped the country, I am a skilled professional, I could get good jobs and I could work for the betterment of my country. But there's also this guilt about not giving the kids the chance to be around family, to grow around their grandparents. Yeah, there is this guilt. But at the same time, there's a sense that you are opening up new worlds for future generations. This may be really hard for me, but it's going to be wonderful for my children, for my grandchildren. Beatrice, after six years in Canada, you then moved to the United States. Why did you choose to immigrate again? And what was that transition like for you? Yeah, so my husband uh, was invited to work for IBM headquarters in New York, in Armonk. And I also secured a parallel job transfer with IBM US. We were both very excited. US was our original dream, and it's a bigger country with more opportunities for us and for the kids. Yeah, we bought a house in Chappaqua, which is in Westchester County, north of New York. It's a very wealthy community. Most of the mothers there do not work, so I did feel a little bit out of place. <laughs> the other cultural shock we had was that in Canada, we felt like we were economically like everybody else. But in U.S., in Chappaqua specifically, we felt like we had less than everybody else. There was a lot more focus on having clothes and expensive cars and all that. And I even felt a little bit of uh, competition in the air. And, you know, it was different for me. But we tried to make the best of it. We made great friends. We met wonderful people. And try to teach our kids that, yeah, money is good. It's great to have money. There was no way we could uh, deny that. But we really tried to teach them that's not how we measure how great people are. Beatrice, while you were living in New York, you turned 40 years old, which became a very pivotal birthday for you. What happened during that period of time? Yeah, when I turned 40, I realized that I had reached an age that my mother had never reached. I had basically lived more than she ever had, and that shook me. 
I started to think more about her. I tried to remember her. I looked for pictures of her, and I couldn't remember much. That's when I decided to go into therapy to explore that. Therapy was really the first time that I looked at my loss from an emotional perspective. I was very used to thinking things through, and this was feeling things through, which was a new process for me. So I became more curious about who I was as opposed to who I needed to be. Professionally, even, I started to question how much more do I want to grow? Where do I really want to go in IBM? Do I want to do something else? Even in my marriage, I saw that I was not giving all of myself to the relationship. I started to work on getting more open emotionally with Carlos and starting to get closer to him. So all those uh, reflections and changes, of course, they did not happen in one day or even one month, but they started when I was, was 40, and uh, that's when I feel that my life really changed directions. Beatrice, therapy in midlife can begin to open you up to all sorts of insights. What did you learn about yourself during that period? I learned that um, there was a part of myself that I was not familiar with. I was afraid of looking into myself uh, because I did not want to feel pain. And I remember watching a movie, uh, Revolutionary Road, <laughs> and there was a scene where Leonardo DiCaprio is asked, so what do you want? And he says, I want to feel things, really feel them. And... That's what I said, oh, that's what I want. I want to feel things. And I realized that I needed to go through that. I needed to open up to feelings. Beatrice, Revolutionary Road, of course, is a novel about suburban life and the quiet desperation of the American dream. You and Carlos decided to move again, this time to Charlotte. Why? Yeah, so our life in New York was great, but I feel that we were still searching for something. We wanted to live in a place that we could be more of ourselves, that had less competition, that had more diversity, and also that was more affordable and that we would feel more part of the place. We, did it, we felt that we didn't really belong to Chappaqua, and we were still looking for that place where we could belong. Yeah, and then we knew that we wanted to educate our daughters. We wanted them to go to universities, and we knew that North Carolina offered wonderful public universities. So we came here to visit. We went to Charlotte and to Raleigh. We loved Charlotte, the trees and the environment, and we found a great IB school for the girls. Came here, did house hunting, found a house, went back to New York, <laughs> packed everything, and then uh, moved here. And we are very happy here. We really love Charlotte. From all the places I lived, uh, this is my favorite. Beatrice, you and Carlos and your two daughters moved to Charlotte in 2011. But your life changed again in the summer of 2017. What happened that summer? It was a really hard summer for me. I was working at IBM. I was still working from home. My role was of a business value consultant. So I was basically helping clients to develop business cases to justify the purchase of IBM products. But I was seeing that this role was slowly being outsourced by IBM. I saw some of my colleagues lose their jobs, and I knew something was coming for me. But still, when that happened, when I got the call from my manager saying that I was being let go, it was really hard. I felt betrayed. I thought it was really unfair. I felt angry. It was much harder than I thought it was going to be. It was the end of 27, 28 years of, with a company. So this was uh, the beginning of a really hard summer for me. A little after that happened, uh, my father went into surgery in Brazil. There were some complications uh, from the surgery. So I went to Brazil, and I went from the airport straight to the hospital in the morning to see him. 
I came back in the afternoon to be with him again, and he passed away that evening. It was almost like he was waiting for me to come to Brazil so he could go. So it was really hard. My father represented that unconditional love that only parents can give you. He was the kindest person I have ever met. He also represented safety. And it was a weird feeling to not have a parent anymore. I felt really lost. So I came back home to the U.S., to Charlotte. And at the time, I had a beautiful black pug who was about to turn 10 years old. And when I got home, he got sick and he died. And it was, uh, I don't know, I felt that I was at the bottom and I was just being kept there. It was like waves crashing on top of me, not letting me come up for air. It was really tough. In the middle of all that, my younger daughter was graduating high school and I was getting ready to send her off to college, which meant that... I was not going to have kids at home anymore. I would be an empty nester. <laughs> then I started to think, why is this whole happening at the same time? Is there a message from the universe for me here? Is there anything I need to do about all that? And it was hard. Beatrice, the columnist David Brooks recently wrote a book called The Second Mountain. The first mountain is the one that we climb for professional achievement. And then often... Sometimes in life, there is a series of events that bring us back to the valley before we have to climb a second mountain. What was this valley experience like for you? So here I am at 48, and I don't have any of my usual and familiar routines anymore. I was used to being an IBMer that was part of my identity, so I lost my professional identity. I lost my father. I had no parents anymore. I lost my dog. And I lost being a mom with having kids at home. It was a really emotional time for me. Then I began to search for something, search for something that would help me to give meaning to everything that I was living. And I turned to yoga. One of the first things I learned in yoga was to breathe deeply and do some belly breathing. And that felt amazing to me. I also did hot yoga. I loved the sweating that happened with hot yoga. I loved the release of tension that I felt. And I remember one moment at the end of a yoga class, we were in Shavasana just laying down and she said, there is nothing you need to do right now. And I thought, oh, that sounds so wonderful to not have to do anything. Through yoga, I also discovered meditation and the idea of sitting with your breath and observing your mind sounded actually familiar to me. I was used to observing my mind. But the difference now is that I was not trying to understand what was happening. I was just trying to live in that moment, in the present. And through that, I was also able to understand that that is really where God is. It's in the present. It's not in anything I'm doing. It's just in what I'm living in the moment. It was really good for me. I felt that release of responsibility about having to act, having to do. And I started to learn to just enjoy the present moment and enjoy being. Beatrice, this is when you began to climb a second mountain. With this insight, you started a new professional journey. So one of the insights I had through my meditation practice was that I really enjoy learning new things. I am a lifelong learner, and I wanted to explore that, continue to explore that side of myself. I enrolled at UNC Charlotte as a post back student and started taking classes. I took classes in religious studies. I took classes in liberal arts. And then one semester, I was looking for a class on Thursday evening because that's what I had on my schedule. 
and I saw a class called the Professional School Counselor. And I think, oh, that's interesting. And I enrolled and I learned about what it meant to be a professional school counselor. It really spoke to me. I thought I could use some of my existing skills. There was a lot of organizing and planning, and I am good at that. <laughs> but also, it gave me something that I was searching, which is counseling and looking into emotions and talking to kids about what they were living and taking them through difficult times. So I jumped into it, and I am actually graduating <laughs> next week, and I am really proud about it. As I think about this choice, now that I'm graduating, I think part of my decision to pursue school counseling was to help kids to go through difficult times, to give kids something that I didn't have, which was somebody to talk to, really time to process emotions. But I'm also wondering if I'm doing that to help heal my own childhood pain. I believe it is a bit of both. Beatrice, how do you see your life? I see my life as a journey of moving from going through the motions of doing, of achieving, of reaching goals to where I am right now, which is more this phase of being, of really enjoying the moment. I do feel more self, more calm. I almost found this new ability to surrender to whatever is happening with me. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to achieve anything or even prove anything to myself or to anybody else. But at the same time, I just turned 50. I feel I am young and I do feel this is not a moment of conclusion for me. I don't know what is left to do yet, and I'm just uh, allowing myself to be fine with not knowing and enjoying this journey. What's next for you? There's one thing that I know. <laughs> There's still one planning that I'm making, and my husband and I, we are planning to move to Portugal. We don't know when exactly this is going to happen, but we already made that decision. We visited Portugal. We loved the country, the culture. It's our language. So it's almost a little bit of coming back at this phase in our life to something that feels very familiar to us. And also being in Europe, we will allow for travel and exploration. I think it aligns with my needs for learning and for growth. And I do see myself as this global citizen. I love to travel. I love to experience new countries, new cultures. And one way that I want to travel is by walking. Europe is full of beautiful town-to-town -town walking trails. And walking is a, is a slow mode of traveling. All you have to do is you wake up, you tie your shoes, you put on your backpack, and you basically follow the path to whatever next town it leads to. I do see walking as a good metaphor to where I am today. I have no big plans of what I, things that I need to do or accomplishments that I need to get to. All I want to do is put one foot in front of the other <laughs> to enjoy the moment and to keep going forward. Thank you for your time today, Beatrice. You're welcome. Thank you. Beatrice Friedman is a school counselor, yoga instructor, and IT consultant. She earned a bachelor's degree in computer technology from the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, a master's of business administration degree from the Institute of Financial Markets in Rio de Janeiro, and a master's degree in education from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And now, a personal word. The night before my conversation with Beatrice Friedman, I began reading The Second Mountain by David Brooks. The book is an exploration of what it means to live a meaningful life. Brooks believes meaning is found in moral concerns, our regard and commitment to our work, to our friends and family, 
to our faith and philosophies, and to our community. The sum of our lives depends on what choices we make and how well we honor those commitments. David Brooks and I have that view in common. Indeed, this podcast is an assertion about this core belief. We are as good as our devotions and how we embody them. Brooks notes that people who are fulfilled have often climbed two mountains in life. The first mountain is one of personal ambition. We go to certain schools, pursue certain degrees, accept certain jobs, marry certain people to show our merit and experience personal happiness. But then one day we look around and the view is unsatisfying. Something is missing in our lives. Things happen that knock us back. A loss of a career, the death of a loved one, an illness, the end of a relationship. We enter a valley. We experience a season of suffering. During this time, something is exposed. We become raw. Some of us are broken apart. Others are broken open. If we are fortunate, a transformation occurs. Sometimes suddenly, more often slowly, we find within ourselves what matters most. We elevate our desires. We shift our devotions from what we want from life to what life wants from us. We discover purposes greater than ourselves, and we begin climbing a second mountain. The second mountain is a surrender to calling. We give ourselves over to a cause. We give ourselves over to love and intimacy. We see what is good outside ourselves and in each other. In work we have chosen, we carry the burdens of others. We may experience very difficult days, but we find serenity in our resolve. Brooks notes that the two mountain shape is not a formula. Our lives have many shapes. Whatever shape it takes, we find grace in the promises we keep. Beatrice spoke about her journey from a young girl who suppressed her emotions, who went about life independently and analytically, who studied self-improvement, who climbed the first mountain of professional success, planning her way to opportunity. She thought about what she wanted and took action to make it happen. She sought to evolve and become the most accomplished version of herself. This led to new lands of possibility. But then something was missing. Relationships were not all they could be. Feelings that she had long suppressed rose to the surface. Not at once, but over time, she shifted what was important. Then came the season of suffering, the loss of her career, the death of her father. Beatrice broke open. In the rawness of her emotions, she explored what was true about herself, and she gave herself over to new commitments, to counseling children in school, to helping them calm their minds and access their hearts, to serving them through acts of care and healing herself in the process. There is something else at work with Beatrice. It is something I know well as I have lived my own version of it. It is a strange combination of analytical thinking with Brazilian sentimentality. She has lived the life of a corporate technocrat, managing projects, considering contingencies, accomplishing tasks, realizing outcomes. It is a world of organization and spreadsheets and conference calls. It is a world of efficiency and calculation. Yet Brazil is an old world place of extended family, of warmth and hospitality, of informality and affection. Brazilians are emotional people. They touch, they kiss, they embrace, they yearn for what once was and what will be. This mixture of technical skills and emotional impulse requires discipline to balance. It can spill at any time and often does. I sense Beatrice learned the benefits of control. Beatrice is preparing for more mountains to climb. She is a planner and lifelong learner. She is an adventurer who takes measured risk and she sees life as the precious thing it is. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by 
the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade of creative education in the arts and design. Thank you to our funding partners and to my teammates, Andy Go, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.